a lot of people in here. Great. Yeah. All right, everyone, thank you so much for your patience. Um, I think more people will be trickling in, but I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, Alicia? All right, thanks, Christina, absolutely. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight as we talk about the collective giving, uh, about collective giving, the power of collective giving and collective impact, or as we say, the power of we. My name is Felicia Davis, and I'm the president and CEO of Chicago Foundation for Women, and I'm so excited about tonight's event. The Giving Councils and Circles really do hold a special place in my heart, and I can't wait to hear what tonight's featured speakers have to say. Chicago Foundation for Women has six geographic and affinity-based Giving Councils and Circles with close to 200 members. The first grant from one of our councils was awarded in 2004, and earlier this year, they collectively, all of our Giving Councils and Circles collectively surpassed a million dollars and investments, which is phenomenal. That's a great accomplishment and we are so proud of all their hard work. And it really speaks to the testament of what can happen when people come together for the power of we. As a founding member of one of the giving circles at CFW, the Southside Giving Circle, it was important for us as members to partner with an organization committed to supporting the community. And at CFW, we consider the members of the giving councils and circles as partners um, often teachers in some respects, helping us to deepen our own understanding and reach into the communities that we serve. Often these members, um, they join our staff like Ellie who came from um, one of the circles, me. Um, they join our board of directors as many have done or continue to stay engaged even beyond their initial membership in their council or circle, which is a true testament to the power of the relationships that have been fostered by each other and also with CFW. We often hear that once you attend one CFW event, you're part of our community for life. And the Giving Councils and Circles are intentional about supporting smaller grassroots organizations that may not be eligible to receive traditional grant funding. This is critical um, to point out since many of these smaller organizations are really the backbone of our communities. I mean, one of my greatest um, I guess challenges, you know, when I was in the public sector, and even a challenge for philanthropy is this notion that um, organizations have to measure their impact in a certain way and have um, audited financial statements and uh, a study and all of those things to 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 to, to kind of like prove that they're worthy. Um, and our giving councils and circles know that the worth is really in the work, and they really um, center our communities. Um, in those decisions. During tonight's breakout sessions, you will have the opportunity to hear from some of the Giving Councils and Circle grantees um, where you can learn more about their work and the impact that the funding from the Giving Councils and Circles had on the organization. Right up front, we're gonna say this and we're gonna say it over and over tonight. Each and every one of us is a philanthropist in our own way. And collectively, we can create the change we wanna see in the world. CFW's giving councils and circles are powerful examples of the impact of a group of a group of individuals can have on their communities. These groups create spaces to share their knowledge and expertise, bringing forth their lived experiences and ensuring their voices are part of the funding process. We definitely are stronger together and are changing the narrative of philanthropy for the better. Um, I often say this, that my, the, my earliest examples of philanthropy are not people who have a building dedicated in their name. Um, I said this before, unless you, you know, uh, and their portrait isn't anywhere unless you look in, our, in a church basement, um, but their impact is surely, surely felt. Um, and so with that in mind, I'd like to introduce Akira Barclay, a consultant and founder of Fresh Philanthropy. She is a dynamic philanthropy professional 
leveraging over 20 years of experience in grant making, fundraising, strategic partnerships, media and marketing to inform her work with donors. She is a co-chair of CFW Southside Giving Circle and Akira will share with us a brief overview and history of giving uh, circles tonight. Akira, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I, I am, um, thank you, Felicia. I am so happy to be with you all this evening um, to give you a little bit about uh, collective giving groups, giving circles. So we'll just jump right in. Um, collective giving, um, described in the most simple way, uh, is the act of like minded people pooling their resources and deciding together how to distribute them in support of a common cause. Um, I'm gonna share my screen with you. Collective giving models like Chicago Foundations for Women's Giving Circles and Councils are a well-established practice that dates back to the beginning of the United States and for many have roots in cultural practices from around the world. For example, some of you might be familiar with a Susu in African and Caribbean cultures, or maybe even a Ge uh, in Korean culture. But giving circles are a flexible grassroots model that is easily adapted to a community's needs and the financial resources of the people engaged with each co collective giving group. They engage Tens of thousands of people distribute tens of millions of dollars annually and are one of the fastest growing forms of giving in the United States. Giving circles vary widely in their size, structure, member demographics, and issue areas, and most make their grant making decisions in a democratic fashion where, where members cast votes and majority rules. 60% of giving circles are identity-based, meaning they are organized around shared characteristics like gender, orientation, race and ethnicity, or religious affiliation. 54% of women's giving circles, 54% of giving circles are women's giving circles, and 70% of giving circle members are women. Um, and since 2007, that number of giving circles has tripled to 1,500, um, granting around $1.29 billion. Among the first collective giving groups was the Free African Society, founded in 1787 by Absalom Jones and Richard Allen in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The Free African Society's main goal was to uh, aid, to provide aid to newly freed black people so that they could build strength and their, um, develop their skills as leaders in the community. Free black Americans agreed to pay one shilling a month into a fund that would provide a stipend if they or their wives, widows or children fell into poverty. The Free African Society's framework of pooling resources was successfully replicated throughout the 18th century and provided the underpinning um, of a culture of giving that is still present to this day. Documentation of the modern version of collective giving picks up again um, in the 80s with emphasis on women donors and what will become the predominant presence of women's giving circles. Despite gaps in the research, Slow but steady growth in collective giving groups has been noted for uh, 25 years. Giving circles and other collective giving groups play an unmistakable role in philanthropy, bringing diverse voices and perspectives to democratize charitable giving. To better understand the importance of these collective giving groups, think about them against the backdrop of the traditional philanthropy sector, which is exclusive, narrowly defined by wealth, um, and really dominated by the people with the most power in society, which then um, 
creates a transactional relationship between donor and grantee. But conversely, collective giving groups and giving circles are more accessible, they're flexible, responsive to community needs, and really defined by com communal care and a sense of shared humanity. Um, giving circles um, being absent of the common obstacles related to age, race, gender, and socioeconomic status, um, th those that are put in place by other forms of philanthropy, um, it makes giving circles attractive um, and engage people who are underrepresented um, or who have historically been excluded from traditional philanthropy spaces. Giving circles expand participation and enables people with less discretionary wealth to have a bigger impact on an issue or organization. They also help shift the narrative and prove that the super wealthy are not the only people who can make a difference in their communities. Collective giving is simply a philanthropic experience that differs from the traditional image of philanthropy. And it impacts giving circles that members, hosts, and beneficiaries in various ways. Uh, most notably, collective giving groups bring a wider range of expertise to the grant making process that includes the lived experiences of the giving circle members. Uh, giving circles value the voices of their grantees and respect their agency in discovering solutions to their own problems. Uh, giving circles provide learning opportunities for their members. Uh, giving circles volunteer their time and provide technical assistance in addition to the funding. Um, they operate with trust and a higher tolerance for risk. They expose members to community needs and organizations in their own backyard, broadening the knowledge and encouraging personal involvement. Um, a huge one, um, giving circles tend to disrupt negative funding trends um, by stepping into voids left by traditional philanthropy. And they develop relationships between members and help build stronger ties to the community. I'm really excited um, to hear from CFWs, uh, giving circles and councils directly um, to hear about uh, their perspective and their impact in this way. But before um, uh, we move on to the panel, I wanna first address uh, the impact of giving circles on their hosts. Um, while some collective giving groups are standalone organizations, 42% of giving circles report having a, a fiscal sponsor or some sort of formal relationship with an institutional host, uh, most commonly a community foundation. Um, my own research explored ways that community foundations could build meaningful partnerships with collective giving groups to strengthen community philanthropy overall. My conclusion uh, then, and still is, that opportunity exists for traditional philanthropy institutions to develop deeper connections to donors from underrepresented communities by playing a strategic role as an institutional ally to giving circles. I'm looking forward to hearing from Ellie Marsh on the panel about this aspect of impact. Today, giving circles um, and other collective giving groups are experiencing new attention due in part to their effectiveness at meeting urgent needs brought on by COVID-19. For 2020 and beyond, philanthropy as a whole can benefit from adopting some of the elements of collective giving groups, namely embracing the idea that philanthropy is not limited to the wealthy the wealthiest and the most powerful in society, but open to everyone. Think about um, support for black women led community centered solutions to issues. Um, consider support for organizations that are younger in their life cycle with smaller budgets and value a community's expertise 
and agency in defining solutions to their own problems and also support civic engagement. Uh, the work that impacts the root causes of those issues that affect the people that, that you wanna help most. So I'm so glad uh, to be able to have shared a, a sort of grounding in collective giving and giving circles. Thank you. Akira, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the fascinating background and history of giving councils and circles and the collective action. Much of the history related to giving councils and circles is linked to the more recent history. So thank you for sharing that this concept is not new and that it's been around since the 1700s. As this pandemic continues to ravage our communities, I think more of these types of collective giving models, I think more of these types will surface to address the immediate and urgent needs that will arise in our communities that have arisen in our communities, just like they did so many years ago. Um, and we are witness, all of us right now, to so much that's being that's happening in the form of mutual aid and um, new conversations about what that looks like. Now we're going to start our conversation on how grassroots philanthropic movements can empower like-minded donors to amplify their impact with members of our six giving councils and circles facilitated by Akira. I like to introduce our remaining panelists. Marguerite Griffin is Senior Vice President at Northern Trust. As Director of Philanthropic Advisory Services, she is responsible for the delivery and growth of Northern Trust's philanthropic advisory services to wealth management clients. She specializes in administering charitable trusts and private foundations and facilitating family philanthropy retreats. She is a member of the LBTQ Giving Council and the Southside Giving Circle. Welcome. Dr. Sonal Gupta is an integrative psychiatrist Psychiatrist, sorry y'all, it's COVID brain. So Dr. Sonal Gupta is an integrative psychiatrist who specializes in women's health and psychology. Through her medical practice, she has seen firsthand how much need there is for women and girls in the Western suburbs. And she has been a member of the Western Suburban Giving Circle for four grant making cycles and has been co-chair for three of those cycles. She serves her community by addressing mental health and the work she does with the circle. Tashasha Henderson is a program associate at Grand Victoria Foundation. She is responsible for highlighting the foundation's impact and uplifting its grantees work through strategic communications, working collaborative with the program team. And she is the co-chair of the Women of Color United Giving Council. Ali Marsh is the Director of Social and Community Impact here at Chicago Foundation for Women. She works to elevate community decision-making and funding determinations, leveraging the power of collecting give, collective giving and building capacity to center gender and racial equity in philanthropy. She is also CFW's liaison with the Giving Councils and Circles, ensuring the communication flows between the foundation and the councils and circles, she is also a member and co-chair of the LBTQ Giving Council before she was a member, before um, she joined the CFW team. She also was instrumental in launching the now famous, I'll say world famous, soon to be, the International Women's Day Dance that's, used, that's hosted by the LBTQ Giving Council. Jasmine, Yasmin Sanchez is a center coordinator at the Center for Health Equity Research in Chicago. She has devoted her career to advancing research on how social structures and determinants contribute to marginalized groups' health. She is passionate about the social justice issues and women's productive reproductive rights. She is co-chair of the Young Women's Giving Council. Stephanie Szymanski is the Director of Investments at Gore Creek Asset Management where she focuses on due diligence and portfolio management for investments across public and private mark, uh, markets. She is a member of the North Shore Giving Circle. Whitney Wade is a talent acquisition specialist for McCormick Foundation. In addition to her recruiting work, she also supports some of the foundation's grant making in its education and youth development, workforce development, and health and wellness portfolios. She is a native Chicagoan and co-chair of the Southside Giving Circle and she was a member of the Women of Color United Giving Council. And Akira, not me, will lead this discussion. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you, Felicia. And um, welcome members of CFW's Giving Circles and Councils. I'm so excited for this conversation this evening. And I would love for you to start um, by just giving your name um, and just briefly uh, what your uh, Giving Circle is uh, focused on. Yes, so we can start with Marguerite. Thank you, Akira. My name is Marguerite Griffin. I'm a member of the LBTQ Giving Circle, and we are focused on supporting LBTQ-led and focused nonprofit organizations in Chicago. I've been a member of the Giving Circle for two and a half years now, perhaps. Yes, I'll say three. I'll just claim that. Very Wonderful. happy to be here. Thank you. So now. You are still on mute. I'm talking to myself here. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Sonal Gupta and I go by pronouns she and her. And um, I have been in the circle for four uh, cycles and uh, co-chair for three. And our focus in the Western suburbs is to um, reach out to nonprofits that are grassroots organizations for uh, that are women led uh, of women of all ages. Glad to be here. Tasha. Hey, my name is Tasha Henderson. Um, I am uh, a co-chair of the Women of Color United Giving Council. And we focus on funding organizations that are led by and serve uh, women and girls of color in the city of Chicago. Thank you. Yasmeen. My name is Yasmeen Jasmine. Um, I'm in the Young Women's Giving Circle. Um, and we prioritize really in um, community building and um, member engagement and um, for grants, we focus on younger or newer uh, small grants um, and also prioritize women of color. Thank you, Stephanie. Hi, I'm Stephanie Szymanski. My pronouns are she, her. I am going into my fourth cycle with the North Shore Giving Circle. And we focus our giving um, pretty broadly across the areas that CFW focuses on, but center our searches for organizations serving Northeast Cook County and Lake County. Wonderful. And Whitney. Hi everyone, I'm Whitney Wade. I am a co-chair of the Southside Giving Circle. We focus on supporting organizations on the South Side that benefit black women and girls specifically and that are led by black women. This is our third year and my first year as co-chair before the Southside Giving Circle, I was a member of the Women, U women of Color United Giving Council for three years. Thank you so much. Um, and Ellie, um, I, I just want to um, maybe move in to getting a little bit from you all about why you made the choice to give um, in this collective fashion versus um, individually. I'm happy to start if that's okay. Yes. Um, I originally joined to learn more about my community and be a part of the community after I'd moved to Evanston. Um, I'd never been part of a giving group before and I was a little nervous just because I I like control of things. Um, but you know, I also had realized that I was giving to areas and to organizations just based on what I saw and what my experiences are. So Akira, your, your power and impact slide really spoke to me because that's exactly what I am getting out of my experience. And that's this collective giving has opened my eyes to so many more issues, needs, and ideas than I ever would have seen if not for joining forces with all of these women who have very different life experiences. And so while I joined to learn about my community, I've learned so much about my community, my neighbors, and frankly, myself. Um, and, and I'll throw out, despite some perceptions about the North Shore, which may or may not be true, there is still a tremendous amount of need here. Um, 
Northeast Cook County and Lake County, which I'm also very grateful for learning, which I wouldn't have gotten, but for this group. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, anyone else? Yeah, I can jump in actually. I, I really echo what Stephanie said. Um, I think that uh, people also have a misconception about the Western suburbs being affluent um, and that there's no need. Um, I think uh, probably about six years ago, I had gone to um, you know, uh, volunteer at a PADS um, in my area. And I thought there were, there were really not, not too many homeless people, but I was surprised to see how many people showed up that night looking for a pad to, uh, to spend the night. And that really got me thinking about the needs of specifically women, because I do, you know, since I'm a psychiatrist and I focus on women's mental health, that got me thinking a lot about uh, women's needs in general in my community. So this is a real, a way for me to lift them up in a multifaceted way. That's wonderful. Um, Marguerite, Whitney, or Tisha, um, like what is the, the significance um, for you um, in giving in this way? Yeah, so I'm a part of two giving circles and as, as my day job, I am a philanthropic advisor. And so I first came to the giving circles thinking that I would have something to offer because I'm in, I work with philanthropists all over the country. I've been engaged in thinking about funding issues um, related to social change and social justice for all of my career. And I initially thought that, yes, this would be a good place to volunteer and share um, the skills that I've developed. But I found that I've learned so much as a result of my participation with the giving circles. And in particular, the LGBT giving circle, you know, you learn a lot about what these organizations need, um, what their challenges are. I know that for every hundred dollars that's given by US foundations, only 28 cents goes to LGBTQ issues. And a lot of the work that we're doing with our circle is not just addressing some of the issues and challenges they have around programming, but it's also helping to build the capacity of these organizations so that they can do more of the work that they're doing and so that they can attract funding from larger funders. So that's very important to me. And I think that's a really good way that giving circles can be effective. And that is highlighting some of the issues that are important to the communities that are important to us and also helping to build the capacity and draw attention to the work of these organizations, many of whom the, the leaders are working in isolated ways and really could use the support and guidance and just the enthusiasm that comes when you bring a group of women together to give and to notice the work that they're doing. Absolutely. And this is a perfect example of the disruption of a negative funding trend where the LBT uh, giving circle is sort of stepping into this area where L LBT um, issues are underfunded. So that really brings me um, to a specific question for Whitney, because um, similarly, we know that uh, women of color leading grassroots organizations achieve the most success at social change, but in, uh, 2018, I think, only received about a half of 1% of the 60, $66.9 billion um, given by traditional foundations. And so um, I want to ask Whitney to share a bit about the Southside Giving Circle um, and, and how their work really addresses this. Thanks, work. Akira. That's a good question. So I did, um, and I saw that statistic in a report called Pocket Change, put out in part by the Miss Foundation for Women. I want to say it came out earlier this year or maybe the end of last year. So if you haven't read it, take a look at it. It talks about how we receive very little funding 
Um, but a lot of our work is really intersectional. We're tackling multiple issues. We're using all of these strategies. And the work of the South Side Giving Circle is important uh, because we're really trying to figure out how to get Black women-led organizations and other uh, women of color-led organizations on the map. A lot of us are usually not a part of conversations for large fund funders and we're not visible to large funders. For example, some foundations are um, invite only. So someone has to know you. And if you're small and they don't know you, you may not have an entry point for a conversation with institutional donors. And another thing for smaller organizations, and by small, we mean uh, we're funding organizations with budgets of less than $500,000. Um, people typically assume that that means you have a smaller impact or just a smaller sphere of influence. A lot of our grantees don't have paid staff which means that we don't have time, you know, they may not have time to spend on these time consuming funding proposals. Anyone who's written a grant knows how long it takes. You have interim reports, you have all this information. So if you have one or two staff people for your entire organization filling out these proposals, you know, it takes a lot of time. So that's just another barrier to funding for some organizations. Um, and additionally, you know, our work in philanthropy um, it's just largely unrecognized or we're doing things in different ways that that are not considered traditional philanthropy and so we are just oftentimes left out of the conversation so that's why that's why we like to focus on smaller organizations black women-led organizations that are typically not receiving support because of their size or because they may not be connected to larger institutional donors and that's so important. Um, and Yasmin, with the Young Women's um, Giving Circle, um, it, you have a similar focus in terms of supporting organizations. Um, it, talk to us a little bit about um, the experience of um, sort of learning how the Giving Circle um, meets these organizations' needs. Yeah, so a um, little bit of background for me. So I'm like, I come from research um, and um, just how CFW and YWGC um, does grant giving, it's very different. So kind of what Whitney was touching on, um, something that I've learned is just really focusing on these smaller organizations, which are typically considered more riskier to fund. But um, I think we have seen how the impact um, that it has had on these smaller organizations. So some of the organizations that we have funded have um, really leveraged funds within CFW and you can see them, their impact and how they've grown. So for many of these organizations, we might even be the first funder. Um, one great example, Brave Space Alliance, um, they received funding a few years ago and you can just see how much impact they've done in the city and how much their organization has grown as well. Um, yeah. Thank you. And um, I, I wanna go back to another um, aspect of collective giving groups and their support um, for advocacy. And I wanted to ask Stephanie a bit about um, North Shore Giving Circle and how they are uh, sort of making a shift in that direction. Sure, it's, uh, we've been around for quite a few years. It's been just over the past few years that we finally started to figure out how important advocacy and civic engagement is to our giving. You know, we were really resistant at first to consider advocacy programs because we struggled to understand them. And, and it was, it was our lack of understanding, not anything about the programs, it just seemed much easier to see the impact of a direct service. You know, how do you measure or benchmark something that's addressing systemic issues that have been around forever and are, are addressing issues that can't be solved in a year with one grant. And so it took us a while to get there. Um, but thankfully, Ellie with her patience and Laura York with CFW also came in and presented to us. Um, you know, we each did our own individual research on what it meant and really opened our eyes to how incredible these programs are. So I like to say my personal aha moment was realizing that all of my giving to ACLU and Planned Parenthood Action Fund 
was advocacy. And it was, it was sort of that finally, wow, it does make sense. I do get it. And I'm so happy that we've now supported um, a group specifically around civic engagement called Kofi, where um, you know, they're helping women in women of color in Evanston build the skills and resource and confidence that they need to address these root causes of poverty and help strengthen their security and the security of the community and this creation of leadership among these very women we're intending to help just feels very powerful. And so I think we've we've had this huge eye-opening experience over the past few years as we learned this together as a group. And I think that's also the benefit of collecting collective giving is we may not have gotten there individually, but as a group, we help each other. That's wonderful. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, and so the Women of Color United has a special history at CFW. And so I want Sasha to give us um, a little bit of, about her experience with the group and, um, and, and the importance of sort of taking a leadership role and, and bringing it back through um, changes. Yeah, so um, I joined the Women of Color United Giving Council um, about two years ago, and I was specifically looking to um, like join a group with other women of color. Um, so I really wanted to be in, in that space with other people with like shared um, values and passion for um, you know, just trying to make um, a positive change and contributing like our collective resources. Um, so I thought that was just um, like a really powerful um, way to help our communities. And uh, throughout these two years, I've really um, learned a lot and enjoyed uh, my experiences with the Giving Council. And so I'm really glad to be a part of um, kind of helping to reboot the council and, you know, we're recruiting um, more members. I really feel there's, there's such great potential for us to um, really make um, a significant impact and, um, you know, contribute, um, we distribute resources to organizations led by uh, women of color in the city and provide them with, you know, other resources too. Wonderful. And Ellie, um, Stephanie mentioned um, a moment where uh, you and one of the program officers at CFW um, were able to step in and offer um, guidance. Uh, I want you to um, talk a bit about your role at CFW um, just uh, for information, background information, Chicago Foundation for Women um, hired a full-time leadership council manager in 2009. Um, historically, uh, giving circles and uh, host organizations have had a, a complicated relationship. And a big part of that is having staff time to dedicate to managing uh, giving circles and, and collective giving groups. Um, so Ellie, um, can you give us a bit of information about how CFW manages to do this so successfully? Yes, th thanks Akira. Um, I'm really happy to be here with all of you this evening. And if anybody was having any doubts at all, I hope that they are um, kind of squashed in knowing that we are powerful. Together, we are powerful in this panel um, of incredible women exemplifies that and it is an honor for CFW to be in partnership with them and the rest of the members of the Giving Councils and Circles. Um, and these councils and circles have had a long history with CFW. Um, in fact, CFW was the first woman's fund in the country to establish leadership councils, which we now know as our Giving Councils and Circles. And my understanding is that the want to establish these groups really came um, as a way to address the fact that the donor base was not reflective of the women and girls that CFW was serving or representative of Chicago. And so we applied or the leadership at that time applied for a grant from the Women's Funding Network to get these groups started. 
And this was done under the leadership of the then ED, Christine Grum, and the board president, Mary Morton. And there was this acknowledgement that the continuation of these leadership councils needed, to, needed support to be able to thrive and, and to really become rooted. And so they started by hiring a consultant to staff them for the first couple of years. And this allowed them to understand the needs um, that the leadership councils had and what that relationship would be and really what the scope of work then of a staff person would be. So a staff person was hired and there have been several of us um, over, over the years. Right? Uh, and in June, at the end of our fiscal year, um, there were you know, close to 200 members across these six giving councils and circles, and a seventh one will be launched in 2021 on the west side. So members lead these groups, yes. Um, members lead these groups, they make funding decisions. Their work is centered within CFW's grant making framework. And as staff lead, I support, guide, and provide training so that members are equipped and feel like they have what is needed to participate and to be engaged in the way that they would like to be. So from the onset, these councils were about relationships. Relationships aren't transactional. Instead, they're fostered over time by building trust, valuing one another, and showing up for one another. So investing in a dedicated staff person for these giving councils and circles, CFW is showing that we have a commitment in cultivating relationships with members and in really being partners with one another. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ellie. And so um, from an institutional standpoint, um, what would you say um, are uh, the benefits um, and challenges from hosting uh, collective giving groups? All of the giving council and circle members are creative and innovative and generous. They bring their diverse perspectives to the table and are connected to and embedded in community in ways that as a small staff, we are not able to do. And so kind of within that context are all of the rewards, the impact and the challenges. Um, the cha you know, one of the challenges being um, how to balance the, this innovation and these ideas and the creativity and the want to do more that the councils are bringing to the table um, with what we are, are able to support them with, right? And along those same lines, kind of this balance between needing to have some things operationalized to be able to do the work with a recognition that if the relationship and the learnings aren't there, then whatever has been operationalized doesn't mean anything, right? And so kind of really looking at the ability to leverage technology um, so that kind of technology can help streamline, streamline and automate and connect in ways that can then free up time and mental space from some of the operational items that then can be redirected to that relationship building, the learnings and the innovation and allow more space for that. Kind of in regards to the rewards and the impact, I think about, again, the relationship, the partnership, um, the thought partnership, that hive mind right, and the shared learning. We benefit, we as an institution benefit so much from the giving councils and circles, um, their members, knowledge, insight, curiosity. In partnership, we dig into gender and racial equity and grant making and explore ways of deepening connection with and increasing impact kind of on this network of grantee organizations. Right. And as Felicia mentioned in some of her remarks, the giving councils and circles are a way of introducing new organizations to CFW. Right? Across, um, since the founding of the giving councils and circles, right, over 20% of the organizations that they have funded have been, their grants have been, um, let me back up. The funding they received from the giving councils and circles were the first funding that they received from a CFW fund. Right? And so they were brought into the organization, a lot of them being those emerging organizations that Jasmine spoke about who don't have access to traditional um, funding streams. Mm -hmm. right? 
And then they're, they come become a part of CFW's family and have access to capacity building and leadership development programs, as well as this larger network of organizations um, that are like-minded, that are working towards equity and working for women's rights. And we are connected with them because of the networks of the giving councils and circles, those who are embedded more so in the, in the community or in different ways than we are. Um, so I really see kind of the, those rewards and impact as shared accountability, incorporation of community voice and decision-making, expansion of reach, and an increase in investments directed back to the community. That's just excellent, Ellie. And I just I hope everyone is able um, to see and make this connection about how um, the Chicago Foundation for Women and its six giving circles and councils really exemplify the power of we. Um, that you can clearly see the benefits for both um, the, the members, the grantee organizations in the community and CFW itself. Um, I wanna make sure um, that I have um, let everyone on the panel um, express what they needed to express about, you know, your value for your role before um, we move on to some questions, I think. Okay. So um, I think we had a question, um, Whitney, about the pocket change um, study. Um, someone wants to know if it said anything about um, inequitable funding. Um, I guess they wanted to know if there was any data about um, minority or um, male of color led organizations, I guess if the disparity was the same as a uh, woman of color led organizations. Hmm. I'm not sure. I'd have to go back and take a look at it, which I'll do in a second for you. Um, but I do know anecdotally that black girls specifically get a lot less attention in mainstream and national conversations, particularly around education, school discipline, sexual assault and abuse, um, reproductive justice and health. A lot of our concerns in those areas specifically don't get as much attention. I do know that for sure, but I'm not sure about in terms of dollars specifically if the report mentions any comparisons between gender for people, for organizations of color. Akira, can I share something here on that point? Absolutely. Um, so just today, so I've had a couple of conversations with funders this week, including one today just before this event on this. Um, the, anecdotally, the larger and more well-resourced an organization is, the more likely that its leader is to be white male. And in fact, one of the um, women who runs a family foundation said, you know, often men will take their payment, you know, upfront, like they'll take a salary right away or they'll make sure that they have benefits. And we had this very um, lengthy discussion about, you know, for us in philanthropy, I mean, this is a wake up call. I mean, it's not for us in philanthropy to what it really truly means when we're equitably funding organizations so that they can provide health insurance so that there can be retirement that it's, it seems fine and good to have uh, black women led person, people of color, indigenous people led organizations on the struggle bus and have those very people not have the essential things that, you know, we're funding um, advocates to fight for, right? Um, we have uh, nonprofit leaders who say, I, I feel guilty because I recruited someone to take over this organization that I started in my kitchen. And how can I bring her into this life when I don't even have retirement figured out? I don't have retirement. So those are, so when you look at what equitable funding mean, it also means those things. And anecdotally, the organizations that are led by men are usually, you know, men will often, and I heard somebody say this um, at the Center of, for Effective Philanthropy discussion, how he just put it in the budget. <laughs> like, okay, you just put it in the budget and it just, you know, it just happens. So there's a difference um, um, there. 
No, that, and thank you for sharing that, Felicia, because it is um, true. Anyone who's uh, worked in a nonprofit organization or any woman of color who has led an organization can probably tell you a story about the power dynamic that is involved with communicating um, with traditional funders. Um, one of the uh, most important things that our panelists have um, expressed this evening is the relationship that they have with their grantees and how they view them as partners. And that's really um, a result of a, a shared spectrum of power that a collective giving group um, has with their um, grantees so that it is more of a partnership and um, less so of the um, organization's leader trying to justify why they should have a gift bestowed upon them in a way. Um, and even in my experience um, with Southside Giving Circle, I've, I've heard from the leaders of some of our grantee uh, partners that um, they are able to have a different conversation with us about their work. Um, and it, it really just brings to mind how much additional energy women of color leaders have to put into their fundraising pursuits where a lot of the justification of their leadership and their outcomes um, are scrutinized a lot um, more uh, heavily than um, some of the organizations that are led by white men. And so um, I just wanted to kind of connect those dots um, that Felicia is talking about. Does anyone on the panel want um, to share anything else about their uh, relationship with their grantee partners? I think we, um, I don't know, uh, can somebody tell me how much more time we have for questions? I'll jump in. I don't know who, who's going to tell you, but I will. Um, <laughs> I think just we have time for maybe one question if anyone has a burning desire and wants to ask. Otherwise, I know Felicia wants to share uh, just a few things before we head to our breakout rooms. Awesome. Going once. So I'm sorry, I try to share the air, um, but if nobody has a question, I definitely do have one. Um, so that was my question about the inequities between, you know, like funding for minority male organizations versus like organizations that serve, you know, minority women or are also led by minority women. And um, Whitney just shared an article, but I'm wondering if there's an opportunity for you guys like as giving circles through the Chicago Foundation of Women to do some more like intensive like research. Maybe that could be like a big research project type of thing for you guys um, where you work with, you know, each other and also like the organizations that you serve that you work with um, to come up with that research and make that something that's more like seen publicly personally as a woman who run who's a minority my organization serves black and brown girls it has been quite the journey trying to get to funding and I have male counterparts who haven't done half the work that she has done who are getting access to funding presumably just because they're boys you know um, and so I would be interested in seeing what a partnership between you guys could look like to produce that research that's very targeted that you know brings that issue you know to light on like a national scale Dominica, thank you for that um and for offering us the opportunity to um think that through and to be um a leader uh, or lead or take a lead role in that in that way uh, i want to um just take a few moments to thank our our feature speakers um, I want just from the bottom of my heart, Marguerite Solmo, uh, uh, Ellie, who I love and uh, is a great member of our team, to Sasha, Yasmin, Stephanie, Whitney, and Akira. Thank you for that uplifting conversation. Thank you. It was um, engaging, and I know we learned a lot. 
um, to our audience for um, really leaning in with us and learning more about how to leverage collective giving for um, collective impact. And I hope this conversation really um, sparked something in you, encouraged um, um, you to seek out ways to support your community through um, philanthropy, like take the ownership that I am a philanthropist and not just Akira had it in her presentation, not that just the short fat white man on the monopoly box, but you are too. Um, and if you're not a member of a giving council and circle, of course, I um, would um, offer an open invitation for you to join one of the six, soon to be seven, um, giving councils and circles um, hosted here at CFW. And one way that you can show your support now is by donating to one of the giving councils and circles you've learned about today. Each of our councils and circles um, pulls donations to amplify their impact through investments um, to nonprofit organizations, addressing our community's most pressing need. I mean, you've heard that and you'll have an opportunity to hear a little bit more about that in our breakout conversations. So join me in donating to one of CFW's Giving Councils and Circles via the link. There's a link shared and you get, this is donor's choice. Um, and you get to pick um, which of the Giving Councils and Circles you'd like to um, support. And we wanna thank you for that in advance. I'm gonna pause to make sure you can pull out your cell phone and do that. All right. So now when you register, you chose to learn more about one of the giving councils and circles. And we will now move to those breakout rooms. Each of the giving councils and circles will be hosting one of their grantees who will be sharing more information about their work and the impact the funding um, from the council and circle has had on the organization. I need to give a few housekeeping notes. Um, each room is named for each giving council and circle. If you are placed in an incorrect room, please come back to the main room and we will help find out where you should be and move um, you there. I know one person said at me that they didn't get an assignment and I hope by now they have received an assignment. If you did not choose a room, please stay in the main room and you can let us know which room you'd like to join and we will assign you. Um, if anyone needs um, the sign language interpreters in the room, can you also please let us know? We'll bring the ASL interpreter into that room. And for those facilitating the breakout rooms, please wait a minute or two to give people time to join the room. And at 725, we'll close the breakout rooms and bring everyone back to the main room to close out the event overall. So uh, thank you and have great conversations. And I look forward to seeing you back in about 30 minutes.